This is a film about mistaken identity. It's about what happens to people when we jump to the wrong conclusions. It's about the difference between what we see and what we think we see. Most of us try not to think too much about the bad things in life. Our lives are already difficult enough as it is without having to worry about people who suffer with alcoholism or Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia. We like to think that all these things affect other people living in other places. But when we take a close look at the facts, we begin to see just how much of a self-deception this really is. In any one week, at least 8% of all adults will suffer with anxiety or depression severe enough to call an illness. At least 10% of adults have a serious problem with alcohol. One in 20 are fully blown alcohol dependent. In their lifetime, one in 100 people develop schizophrenia or maybe manic depression. One in every 40 adults is dependent on some other drug apart from alcohol. One in 20 young women suffer from a serious eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia nervosa. And amongst the elderly, dementia affects over half a million people. However hard we try to ignore it, mental illness affects every single one of us. If not personally, then maybe the bloke on the next desk, or that girl on the bus, or your best mate, or maybe your partner, or your cousin, or your brother, or your child, or your mother. Mental illness is so common that it touches every family in the land. Right now, as you're watching this, about seven million people in the UK are living through mental illness, and most of us deal with all this suffering by politely trying to ignore it. And when we find ourselves in a situation where we can't ignore it, well, just think about the ways that we react to it. Oi, you nutter! <laughs> They're dangerous, they are. If they open up that home, I'll have to take ten grand off the asking price. Clinical depression, my ass. All she needs is a damn good kick up the backside. Sometimes I take the minutes at the tenants meeting and they're all going about all these care and the community types. I sit there thinking, should I tell them? That's me they're talking about. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm schizophrenic. I'm schizophrenic. And I am, and I am, and I am. Just why do we react in such a powerful way to something that causes so much pain and suffering to our fellow human beings? And why don't we react like this to people with physical illnesses, things like asthma or diabetes or arthritis? But why does mental illness generate such a powerful sense of discomfort in human beings? In order to answer this question, we have to take a closer look at human nature. And when we do, some of what we find isn't very flattering. We like to think that we live in a rational, civilised society. We like to believe that we have intelligent, scientific explanations for things. But this scientific, rational culture of ours is really only about 300 years old. And for thousands of years before that, we saw the world very differently. For our ancestors, the laws of physics were something terrible, something mysterious. And instead of relying on science to explain our world, we used the ancient ideas of good and evil ancestral spirits, God and the devil. And if we're honest about it, in many ways we still do. Mental illness provides us with an unpleasant reminder that we're not always as civilized and rational as we like to think we are. It lets us know that there's still a wild side to our nature which is much less rational, much less well understood. And when we don't understand something, it's easy to be afraid of it. And when we're afraid of something, we usually do one of three things. We hide from it, we laugh at it, or we attack it. And this is exactly what we do to people who suffer with mental illness. Because of our fear and our uncertainty, we stigmatize them. And as a direct result, people can't get jobs, people lose their friends, they lose their homes, and worst of all, they lose hope. 
The scientific educational approach could be used to dismantle stigma and see what it's actually made of. And when we do this, we see that stigma is usually based on four basic patterns of misunderstanding. A schizophrenic who killed a stranger by stabbing him in the eye has been sent to a secure mental hospital indefinitely. Some disorders, particularly the psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia, are seen as dangerous. For many, this is the worst and the commonest stigma of all. But in truth, you're far more likely to be killed by a friend or a relative than by someone with schizophrenia. I've got the will to fail. The will to fail. In conditions such as addiction or depression, the stigma seems to arrive from the idea that the problem is somehow self-inflicted or due to some weakness in the person's character. In truth, anyone can suffer with severe depression. They're a lost cause. And in conditions such as dementia, the stigma seems to come from a powerful belief that there's simply nothing you can do. The prognosis is seen as so bleak, so awful, as to not be worth thinking about, let alone trying to do anything. You just can't get through to them. The fourth sort of stigma is to do with social interaction. Many people, especially those with chronic disorders, are seen as somehow beyond reach, as though communication was a pointless exercise. Shrinker man, shrinker man, put me straight if you can. Free me of my tics and twitches, disconnect my latent switches, shrinker man. When it comes to stigmatised beliefs about mental illness, doctors are just as guilty as anyone else, and the media do more than any other institution to perpetuate false beliefs. Fear and danger sells newspapers. Another challenge lies in selling positive images of mental health. After all, if you were a newspaper editor, which one of these headlines would you put on your front page? And another challenge lies in the danger of telling people how to think. When the government unveiled its own hard-hitting attempt to get people to think about mental illness, it received a very mixed response. Some of the angrier critics argued that it only made things worse. But really, the biggest difficulty we're going to face is the most obvious, stigma itself. We live in a world that's already full to overcrowded with messages trying to get us to do this or to think that. Why can't we just leave the mentally ill to get on with it? Do we really need to worry about something that's been going on like this for hundreds, thousands of years? Well, the simple answer is yes, we do. We can judge a society by the way it treats its mentally ill, and our society is made up of people like you, like me. If we just carry on the way we do at the moment, the odds are that sooner or later, either you, your best mate, or your child will end up on the wrong side of this huge invisible wall that divides our world. We get the society that we deserve. So why not stop, think, understand, go on, change your mind.